Okay, so right now we're going to talk about roller coasters. So, for this problem, roller coasters use a hill for the riders to gain speeds, and then once they get to the bottom of the hill, they're going really, really fast. They use that speed to help them get up this hill so they can go through that upside down loop. Now, these loops are designed so that the bottom radius right here is very, very large. And then the radius up here is going to be smaller. Now, overall, this type of shape is called a clothoid. We're going to construct some force diagrams and quantify them in order to determine why the clothoid is used. So, for the first two parts of this problem, we're given these variables. In loop 1, which is going to be this bottom loop down here, the radius is 10 meters, and the velocity is 22 meters per second. That is when the car is going to be right here at the bottom of this very, very big loop. So, at this point, they would be going this way. So, velocity 1 is going to be 22 meters per second. And then this radius right here is 10 meters. Radius 2, which is going to be up at the top of this loop, right up here, the velocity is 8 meters per second. Now, right here, this is the direction that the cart would be going. And then that will be going at a rate of 8 meters per second. And then the radius here, it's only 5 meters. Now, the mass of the passenger, we're going to be focusing on the actual passenger themselves. Inside of the car, they have a mass of 100 kilograms. So, with those variables identified, we're going to first construct a quantitative force diagram for the passenger when they are at the bottom of the loop. And then, of course, every time we draw a force diagram, we should include the sum of the forces equations. So, I'm going to have a dot to indicate my passenger. First force I'm going to draw every single time ever is the force of gravity pointing down. This is the force of gravity on the passenger by the Earth. Now, when they're at the bottom of the loop, they're still in the roller coaster cart. So they're still going to have, well, the cart exerting some force on them. That's going to be a normal force pushing up on them. Now, when they are at the bottom of the loop right here, they stopped going down and then they started going up. So they have a change in motion upwards. That means that we should have more upward force than downward force. So I'm going to draw a bigger normal force acting on them then I have my force of gravity acting on them. And then it's not going to be by the Earth, it's going to be by, we can say, like the roller coaster cart. So we have two of these forces here. Because they're just sitting in the cart, that's really going to be the only thing that we're going to have that exerts a force. So my sum of my forces acting on the passenger here is just going to be that force normal minus my force of gravity. And we can calculate that sum of the forces by taking the mass times our acceleration. Now, we need to make this quantitative. Now, the uh, first force that's going to be really, really easy for us to quantify is going to be the force of gravity. We know that near the surface of the Earth, we can calculate the force of gravity by taking the gravitational force on the Earth, 9.8 newtons of force for every one kilogram mass, and multiplying that by their mass. Their mass is 100 kilograms. So the force of gravity acting on them is going to be 9,800 newtons of force. Oh, I'm sorry, 980 newtons of force uh, pulling down on them. So this is going to be 980 newtons of force pulling down. Now, because the forces are unbalanced, we need to be able to figure out what that normal force is. We don't have an equation that can directly quantify that. That's why we need to use our sum of our forces equations. We know what the force of gravity is going to be. We are looking for the force normal. So we just need to solve what the sum of the forces is. So our sum of our force is calculated as mass times our acceleration. But we don't know the acceleration. However, we do have an equation for the centripetal acceleration. That's going to be our mass. And then the centripetal acceleration is the tangential velocity squared divided by our radius. We have all these variables, so we're just going to plug those in. Their mass is 100 kilograms. Their velocity at the bottom of the loop is 22 meters per second, and we square that. And all of that is going to be over the radius at the bottom of the loop, 10 meters. So when we plug this into a calculator, 22 squared 
is going to be 484 times 100 divided by 10 is going to give us 4,840. Now the units will be kilograms times meter squared divided by second squared all over meters. Uh, which we could simplify down to kilograms times meters over second squared. But that's going to be the same thing in our units as newtons. So we can just have that in our units. So right now we have our some of our forces. We have our force gravity. So we can rearrange that top equation, our sum of our forces, to get the force normal by itself. So that way our force normal is going to be equal to our sum of our forces plus the force of gravity. The sum of our forces we just calculated as 4,840 newtons of force plus the force of gravity, which is 980 newtons of force. So when we add those together, nope, we're going to get 5,820 newtons. So this right here is going to be the fully quantitative force diagram that we have here. At the bottom of the loop, there's 980 newtons of force pulling the person down, and there's 5,820 newtons of force pushing the person up. That's how they can get to the top of the loop. Now, if we go down to part B, we're going to be constructing another force diagram for the passenger. It's the same passenger. They have not gained or lost any weight. So when we draw a force diagram, we're still going to have that force of gravity on the passenger by the Earth pulling them down. And because it's the same mass, it's still going to be 980 newtons of force pulling them down. However, whereas previously the normal force was pushing up because, well, where they were at the bottom of the ramp was the cart was underneath them. That means that the cart was pushing up on them when they are at the top of the loop. They're upside down. So the person is sitting in the cart. And while the pull of the earth is pulling them down, they also have the seat pushing down on them. So instead of having our normal force pointing up here, we're going to have a downward force normal for, because the seat is above them in relation to them. That's why the normal force here would be pointing down. So it's the force normal on the person by the passenger car. Our sum of our forces would still include that normal force and our force of gravity. But here, both of them are pointing in the same direction. Now, because it's down, we could say that both of these are negative, which in turn would make our sum of our forces negative. But if each of these are the same sign, we might as well make them all the same sign, make it easy for us by making them all positives. So instead of having to worry about a bunch of negatives and double negatives and all of that, it's just positive. We'll just be adding these things together. So we had calculated the force of gravity above. So we don't really need to calculate that again. But I'm still just going to write it down that we know that the force of gravity is 980 newtons. Our sum of our force is still calculated as mass times that centripetal acceleration. So it's still 100 kilograms for the mass. But now we have a different velocity at the top of the loop. They're only going 8 meters per second, but we'll need to square that. And the radius is half. It's only 5 meters. So plugging that into our calculator, we would end up with a sum of the forces here of 1,280 newtons. And remember, that is pointing down for our sum of our forces. But because we made all those signs the same, all positive, we just know that in order to determine the normal force, we need to figure out what the total amount of force was, that sum of the forces, and we take away how much the force of gravity was contributing to it. So we had 1,280 newtons of force for the sum of the forces, and to that, we had 980 newtons of gravitational force contributing. That means that the normal force here, how hard the cart has to be pushing down on the person, was only 300 newtons. This will be our quantitative force diagram here.
with the sum of the forces equation above it. Now, this right here is just kind of our default state for what these two force diagrams look like and what forces are acting on the person when they're at the top and the bottom of the loop. In order to determine why the clothoid shape is used, we need to construct force diagrams if that clothoid shape were kind of manipulated a little bit. This is why we are now supposing that the roller coaster had been designed with that 5 meter radius at the bottom and the large 10 meter radius at the top. So whereas previously this bottom radius was 10 meters, we've now reduced it to 5. And whereas this top radius was previously 5, it is now 10. Now we are assuming that the person still needed the same speed. So the velocity at the bottom when they were right here, that velocity we'll say is still 22 meters per second. And the velocity up here was still 8 meters per second. But now we have different velocities. Sorry, we have the same velocity, but we have different radii. That's going to affect the acceleration, which might affect how much force is necessary. But on the bright side, when we're constructing those force diagrams for part C and part D here, for the passenger at the bottom and the top of these loops, we still have them look the same as they did above. So for part C, where well, we're constructing a quantitative force diagram for the passenger when they're at the bottom of the loop, we still have that downward force of gravity on the person by the Earth. And because they still have that same mass, it's still 980 newtons of force pulling them down. We know that we still need to have more upward force than downward force in order to move them up the ramp. So we still have a bigger force normal on the passenger or the person by the cart than we have for the force gravity. So our sum of our forces equation is going to look the same as well. Our force normal minus our force gravity. However, even though our force gravity is still 980 newtons, our sum of our forces is now going to be different. We still have the 180 kilograms of mass. We still have the 22 meters per second for the velocity. But now, we only have half the radius that we did previously. So that means instead of having our previous sum of the forces as 4,840 newtons, having the radius means we doubled the amount of force that was necessary. So we would end up with 9,680 newtons for our sum of our forces. So when we end up calculating that normal force as our sum of our force plus the gravitational force, it's that 9,680 newtons of force plus the gravitational force, 980 newtons, to give us 10,660 newtons. That would be a lot of force pushing up on a person. In fact, if we even look at the ratio of our normal force to our gravitational force here, that would be our 10,660 newtons divided by our 980 newtons. Right here, this ratio of our normal force to our gravitational force that is a ratio of 10.88. Now what this ratio actually is, this is how many times the force of gravity we have, also known as the number of Gs. So really, right here, we are pulling almost 11 Gs. Now, if you like have ever seen like Top Gun or any other like flying movie, they're, they talk about like the G-force, like how many Gs they're pulling. If you pull 10 Gs, that much force exerting on a person when they do like a sharp turn or something up in a plane. Best case scenario, they're going to be unconscious. If it's anywhere like above 10 Gs, that person is most likely going to die. This force diagram just for part C, where they have are going super fast in such a small radius, means that they would be experiencing such a such a great amount of force that it could potentially kill them. This is one of the reasons why this is not the way that roller coasters are designed. The other reason we can figure out by looking at part D, 
what happens if they're not going fast enough when they are at the top of the loop? So for that, we're still going to construct the same force diagram that we had previously. Up here, we have these two forces pointing down. We're still going to have those two forces pointing down. We are still going to have our force of gravity on the passenger by the Earth with 980 newtons of force. We are still going to have our downward force normal on the passenger by the cart. And we're still going to have that sum of the forces equation that depends on both of these forces being added together. The force gravity calculation has not changed, so it's still 980 newtons. The sum of the forces equation is still going to be the same, mass times our acceleration, or 100 kilograms, times our velocity squared. Here it's 8 meters per second squared all over the new doubled radius, 10 meters. We've doubled the radius, so we should be having the amount of force necessary. So we only need 640 newtons of force pushing down combined in order for the, this cart to be making this route. So if we calculate our normal force, that's the sum of the forces minus our force of gravity, or 640 newtons, minus our 980 newtons of force. That would give us a negative number, negative 340 newtons. What that means is our sign tells us the direction. So even though we've had our positive sign for this part of the problem to be pointing down, in order for this to be the sum of our forces, our normal force needs to be pointing in the opposite direction. This negative sign means the normal force needs to be pointing up. But based on the orientation of where the cart is, it can't be underneath them at the top of the route. Really, what this means is if they were going this fast at the top of the loop, they probably would not have had enough speed to get up there in the first place. So. The reason why you don't have a large, large loop if you're going not too fast is because you just wouldn't make it all the way around the loop, which means that the roller coaster would not be very fun. And honestly, that's the reason why for part E we can say why the clothoid shape is used. The opposite way, a small bottom loop and a big, well, second loop, means that you'd be moving too fast at the beginning which would most likely kill the passengers. And for too big of a loop, you wouldn't have enough force in order to make it all the way around the loop.